the Shiki Science Show clips. Yeah, I mean, that does kind of make sense to me as well. But you've already brought up kind of like where I was heading um, in my thought process with the questions, which is this idea about these wearable um, biosensors, these biodomes, I believe you call them. Um, and you've done uh, experiments in particular with frogs called Senapus, where you've amputated their limbs and you've got them to wear these biodomes and you can see um, regeneration of their limbs. And not only that, but they're also potentially functional as well. And this paper, I believe, came out earlier this year. Um, and I was just wondering if maybe you could elaborate a bit more about what these these biodomes actually are and how they're functioning. Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually had a couple of papers on this. There was one in 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 well, there was a there was a, an earlier one uh, in 2018, and then and then there was this one that just came out. The idea is this: we we are we are very interested in uh morphogenesis as a collective intelligence so we're interested in not micromanaging the process and uh, let's say 3d printing a bunch of stem cells into a very particular structure we're interested in understanding how the collective of the cells normally makes decisions about what it's going to grow when it's going to grow and so on and so our strategy what what we think should be possible is if if, if these hypotheses are correct what should be possible is to find high level triggers that don't sort of babysit the process and try to control everything that needs to happen to make an organ, but actually just shift the, 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 the set point for these cells and then let them do what they do best, which is to reduce error and to build to the set point. So activate that homeostatic process. So we, start, so we started looking for these, uh, for these high level uh, control, control structures. And I could tell you about others that we found by studying bioelectricity. So we make eyes and repairing brain defects and reprogram tumors. So we can talk about that separately. But for the leg thing, we basically found, uh, and this was, this was uh, back in 2010, we, did, we, did, uh, we published some work showing that you can induce tail regeneration. Now tails are cool because they have spinal cord and muscle and so on. So we showed that we can induce tail regeneration uh, just by one hour of application of this specific ionophore. So setting, setting the bioelectric state of the wound uh, using a sodium ionophore, but just for one hour triggers all the downstream cascades, all the gene expression, cell movement, uh, the, all, all, the, all that stuff. So we looked for the same, th we, we used the, um, uh, the same uh, kind of, uh, we, we used the same kind of cocktail and, and some different ones. And the idea was in order to trigger it, you need really two things. You need an environment to convince those cells that it's safe to regenerate, right? So you need some sort of uh, very controlled, closed environment that's almost like amniotic, almost like a limb bud, you know, um, <clears throat> and that they would be able to signal to each other and not get washed out in the in the bath and so on. And then and then you need the payload, which is the signal, the drugs that that cause the signal, right? The, 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 so the biodome is the delivery method and it's the environment, but now you need to have some kind of a drug in there that will activate them. And so we're we're working on a variety of uh, and but by the way I have to I have to do a disclosure so David Kaplan and I are um, co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals Inc. So so Morphoceuticals is is all about taking what we've learned in the frog and moving it into into mammals. So we're doing experiments in mice now and then hopefully clin you know clinical work at some point. So so every you know I have to I have to do that that disclosure and there's a commercial interest here. So the idea so so the idea is that. Um, we uh, David's group created the biodome. The biodome is filled with an aqueous gel that's uh, made of silk, and that gel has uh, <clears throat> various other drugs that 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 we put in there. It's put on the amputation wound for uh, 24 hours, just just one day. That's it, 24 hours, and then you take it off and you don't touch the animals again. And the leg grows over a year and a half. So you wow. get a year and a half of leg, right? So so there's a few amazing things I think about about this. Number one, animals that normally do not regenerate their legs as adults in fact, can be made to regenerate their legs as adults, right? There's, that's even possible. It wasn't known before that that's possible, so it's possible. Number two, uh, it's a very modular effect. In other words, we didn't intervene with the finely shaped gradients for a year and a half. We did nothing. After the first 24 hours, the animal did everything, okay? So, so it's a very, it's a trigger. It's not, um, it's not, it's not a micromanagement type of situation. Number three, um, <clears throat> in that trigger, uh, we didn't even have to specify what organ we want the 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 trigger cocktail is very generic in fact we've done the exact same thing to make tails as it was to make to make legs it's literally a make whatever belongs here signal it's not make a leg so so you never get in, in on a leg amputation you never get a, an eye or a tumor or a tail or a, you know anything else you always get what belongs to the leg <clears throat> so it's a very context sensitive process we're not forcing the cells where 
communicating to them that they should make whatever it is that they already know goes there. The last, and, the, and then the last kind of amazing thing about it is that this cocktail, that was the first one we tried. It wasn't cocktail 78 wow. out of like 300 cocktails that we tried. We didn't have, I mean, originally, one of the limitations of this work is originally, I, I foolishly thought that this was going to be a rapid screening process that we could use before, you know, and it's, 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 it's not rapid by any means. And so we only got to try one cocktail, but the one cocktail we tried was amazing. And so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in luck. And so to me, that's, that, that suggests that it's not that we just happen to have uh, somehow have lucked out onto the best cocktail in the world. Once we optimize this thing, we're really going to see uh, remarkable outcomes. This is just, uh, this is our first guess at it. You know, this is just our first step. Yeah, no, that really is quite incredible. And you've just raised a couple of questions in my head. Firstly, it's like, how soon do you have to intervene after you've like induced the damage? And like, yeah. is there like, yeah. because I guess you have to uh, quickly maybe induce the pattern before you suppress like the the more like scarring of the tissue. And then secondly, what was the rationale behind the decision of the drugs that you used? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know when is the latest that you can do it. We don't know. In older work in the tail, we did investigate this, and we find out that we find out that even after the tail wound forms, what what in for the frog is the equivalent of a of a wound of a scar. So it's basically like this thick non permissive epithelium. Even after that, it still works. I have a feeling that in mammals, what you would have to do is you would have to recut. So if somebody had if somebody had a limb loss ten years ago and everything's healed over. I think you're going to have to reopen the wound, then put on the biodome and then go from there. That's my guess. We don't know, but that's, that's, that's what I think. Um, the, uh, the, choice of, the choice of drugs. So in previous work, we had done a few things. We, we had, we had uh, tested a couple of bioelectric interventions, which are kind of the thing my lab focuses on. Um, we've also done progesterone. The 2018 paper was about progesterone. And that was because uh, the postdoc at the time, uh, Celia Herrera Rincon, wanted to go upstream and try to find something that triggers not only the right bioelectrical signal, but various other changes in the animal that that might be pro regenerative. So she went with progesterone, and it was and, and that was shockingly effective. But right, the new the new cocktail, which is even better, has a number of ingredients, which again, not specifically bioelectric this time. Now we're doing a bunch of bioelectric stuff next. But this particular one had things like, you know, it had a, it had it had a, a neurotrophic factors in it, and it had growth hormone, and it had retinoic acid, which is a positional information molecule for 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 the limb, and it had um a uh, uh kind of a a, a resolve in the, you know so 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 pro pro wound resolution kind of kind of molecule and so on so it was kind of a it was kind of mix a mix of things that we thought would would convince the cells that it's time to regenerate as opposed to you know as opposed to scar and yeah it worked really well and i mean i can't wait to to, to get to try all the different uh, improvements that you can imagine right after the first trial yeah, for sure. And I think you already sort of mentioned it, but as you say, you have the bioreactor on for 24 hours and then it takes like a year for it to regrow the limb. And so in terms of scalability, it's quite hard to maybe, I guess, scale up and try different interventions. But I guess given the remarkable result from your first approach, then that, I guess, gives a lot of promise for identifying um, yeah, better and better combinations as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, at this point, uh, we're in mice now. We're doing it in mice now. But I think uh, there's probably not. Uh, well, if I mean, if, if resources were unlimited, I would, there's still frog things to be done. But 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 given given how long that takes and and limited resources, we're just going for mice at this point. Um, which which also you know which also take a little bit of time. I mean, I, you know, in the end, in terms of clinical uh, clinical um, uh, kind of import, look. Uh, a, 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 a five-year-old's arm is very usable, right? You can write, you can shave, you can you can eat, you can do whatever you're going to do. So if somebody if somebody in their twenties loses an arm in an accident somewhere, and you think that okay, five to seven years later you have an arm that you can you can type and you can do everything with, that's pretty good. That's a good deal. Mm. Even if even if it you know even even if even if it grows no faster than a typical arm, you know a kid's a kid's arm is very usable. So I think I think in the end, even worst case scenario, I think it'll be fine. 
Yeah, for sure. And like in terms of, I guess, as you mentioned, translating it to humans, what kind of like criteria or like tick list of achievements do we need to see before we actually start giving it um, as a human therapeutic? Well, there's a there's a long road. I mean, lots of lots, lots and lots of basic research needs to happen. Right. So I, I, I don't want to give the idea that we're sort of ready to start testing it on humans because we're absolutely not. Um, fundamentally, there's a number of things. I mean, a just to show in mammals that we can deal with all of the things that are different, you know, the blood pressure, the, the, the infection risk, the more complex, uh, you know, um, inflammatory response, the bigger, uh, the bigger uh, diameter of the, of, the, of, the, of the limb itself, you know, all of these things have to be, have to be dealt with. Um, some things will be easier, you know, humans won't be chewing off the, the biodome the way the mice try to do so. So certain, you know, certain things will be, will be easier, but, but there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot that remains still, but, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're on the way. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and one thing that I think is kind of intriguing about this approach is, as you sort of mentioned, is the idea that we don't necessarily need to fully understand the downstream molecular details of exactly how it's coordinating it. We just have to like intervene, I guess, at a higher level. And the reason that I, I think that's interesting is because there's a lot of, I guess, interest at the moment in terms of like personalized genomic approaches to healthcare. And I guess um, this approach, at least at first glance appears to, to be something that might be more universal and maybe the same set of treatments could be applied more broadly and I guess do you think that's the case or do you think there would still be an element of like personalization uh to what like the drug combination could be there there, there is there is going to be an element of personalization only because uh in particular with the bioelectric treatments you're going to want to know in your particular patient, which channels are expressed in the wound, and that may differ somewhat person to person. We'll, we'll find out. But but you're right fundamentally in that this is a much more generic approach for the following reason: in any control structure, the further up you go, the less you have to worry about the details because the whole point of a hierarchical control structure is that the details are delegated. So if if you know if you tell seven different people. Um, you know, uh, go get me a coffee. They may do it completely differently, but and you don't. But the point is, you don't need to uh, specify. Well, you're going to move your right foot three inches this way. Then you're going to. You don't need to do any of that because you're dealing with competent agents that know how to do certain things, and you don't have to worry about your message is exactly the same. Even though in each person, the molecular details, right, of what they hear, how they carry it out, what what chemicals go where in their brain when they hear it, those are all different. But but you're up at a higher level, and so it's. Uh, addressing addressing these kinds of things at higher levels has lots of advantages um and one one of the advantages is that by 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 taking advantage of the fact that you're working with a competent material that already knows how to do things you can leave a lot of the details uh up to the implementation so so you're not going to uh have to worry about which which channels are open when you're going to set a set of bioelectric states and let let the system go from there that that i think you know that that part is going to be the same for everybody and and then and then different very very different things will, will happen downstream sure yeah that, that makes sense um and just one kind of last aspect whilst we're talking about regeneration though is um and contrasting that to the, the more wound healing and scarring approach is that one of my interests is in i guess the circadian rhythm and how there seems to be some differences in I guess like the downstream processes at different times of the day and in particular with wound healing I know that there is like a, an emerging area of research showing that depending on the time of the day when the wound occurs like the healing process can occur at different speeds yeah. and so I was just wondering if you've looked at all into any of the time of day links with these regenerative approaches. It's a fascinating question uh, you're right and and even for, for example now they're finding that for chemotherapy it uh, it really depends when you get it because because the cycling of the stem cells and also of the cancer cells is related to uh, the, the the time of day and so on. Uh, we don't we don't know very much about it. We're studying it. There's a there's a uh, there's a postdoc in the group who's studying time timekeeping in the context of a of a DARPA project on on slowing biological time for injuries and stuff like that. And so so she's working on this, but we we don't know much about it yet. It's still early days.